Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today we are answering two questions, one simple and one not so simple. One is, what is telegraphing? The other is kind of the truth about writer's groups. Before we get into this, I just want to say there are no dumb questions. There are no stupid questions. So if you are a beginner and you don't understand what certain things are, just, you know, pop into the forums. And if you want us specifically to answer them, go into our podcast forum, go into your questions and put a question in the, in, in the uh, forum topic. And I would also like to suggest that you sign up for the mailing list on the alone with invisible people.com site. Um, that allows you to not only receive the weekly uh, link to the podcast it also allows you to just reply to any of those emails yeah asking a question yeah that's a good point just in case you don't want to publicly say you know hey I've, I've got you know this question if, if, if it makes you feel insecure about posting in the forums yeah, you can always just reply. Yeah, but that's one of the ways that we got just a bunch of amazing questions over the past few weeks is I sent out an email to just the guys who were uh, alone in the room with Invisible People subscribers. And they I, we, they said, I said, look, there are no dumb questions. And these are, if you have a question and you don't want your name on it, but you want to uh, ask it, then just reply to this email. And we got absolutely amazing questions from people and none of them were dumb there are no dumb questions they were really good and we're going to use pretty much all of them except the ones that we have already had already answered uh, mm -hmm. in, in previous episodes so so yeah if if you do what holly says if, if you're on the mailing list and you have a question you don't want to post in the forums for whatever reason reply to those and we'll get we'll get those questions and we will either point you in the right direction to the answer if we've already done it or we will and include it in one of the episodes we can't promise to include you know every single question at like a specific date or anything like that but we are definitely trying to hit all of your questions so let's get to the first one uh what is telegraphing telegraphing is a common beginner mistake it is when you tell the reader what is going to happen before it happens and i've got two little examples here for you the first is Little did Bob know that when he reached the crime scene, the corpse would be his girlfriend, Kate. Okay, the problem with this is that you just told the reader what's going to happen, so you have killed the suspense. Yeah. Yes, this is, little did he know, can be used really well, but not like this, because if you, if you know what the character doesn't know, you already know it. A better way to do that one would be a little did he know his whole world was about to to turn upside down right. or change or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's then then you go to the scene and you discover that there's a body and you discover and and he rolls the body over and oh my god it's his girlfriend Kate. Well, you know, his day just got crappy, but you found out at the same time he did. And and then there's that the reader is you are dragging your reader along with you in this this tense scary compelling discovery of what's going to happen rather than than letting having bob not know but having the reader know because the one you don't want to know is the reader the second example that i have is i was playing in the snow with my best friend who would disappear the next day because of the weather if you have uh, a first-person protagonist who is 
talking to uh, the reader directly. You you don't want you want to you to show them playing. You want to show them having fun. Um, you don't you might want to have some sort of little thing about boy the snow is getting so thick. Uh, maybe we better go home because you know we're not we can't even see the road anymore. Yeah. And they go home in their different directions, and the kid doesn't know until he calls his friend the next day, and the kid never came home what happened but it's very important even with first person uh, points of view to not give away what happens to somebody else to let the the first person protagonist take the t- take the time to live through the event rather than just talking about what happens Show yeah. it as it happens. Don't show what happened and kill the suspense. Yeah, don't tell it too early. Don't show it too early. Yeah, right. let let it, let it evolve naturally. And this is since I started reading Lawrence Block, and I'm only reading the Scudder books right now. I'll pick up the other books later, but I just want to kind of read all of those together. Um, and this was one of Holly's recommendations. I have to say, he does that first person suspense really well. He does the first person, even if if he, as the character Scudder, even if Scudder knows something or sus- suspects something, you as a reader find out at the right moment of the the twist, um, and after you've read a few of his novels I think he he kind of he has a way of presenting the twist so that when you hit that moment in the book you know what's coming and you're like oh my god but how and also I I just finished um one of them out on the cutting edge of death and when it showed the person that he was about to talk to and I knew what was coming I was like oh no (laughs) <laughs> oh no 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 not not I I didn't expect that that character to have done what is done but but how but why so you can kind of even train your readers to have that moment of surprise mm-hmm. and he is and, brilliant at that yeah yeah but t- telegraphing can be done in in so many different ways too and and it can be on a subconscious level um where you're kind of where you know things as a writer that you didn't intentionally put in the book that the reader can guess where things are going or can guess what has happened Mm -hmm. and it's not as black and white as holly's examples but it's sometimes even more subtle um and harder to catch yeah but when you're going through your book, if you've set it aside for a decent amount of time, if you've let it, that first draft have that cool down period, this is part of why the cool down period is so important. Then you start reading it again and then you're like, wow. Oh, that was ham handed. Yes. Oh, (laughs) that, that right there just gave away who the bad guy was. Yeah. You know, like I, I, in um, the first draft of the house on Andrews Avenue, I-, I gave away who the bad guy was in the very first scene <laughs> to, t- to one of the characters. And part of it was that it is a ghost. It's, it's a haunting mystery. It's, it's the mystery of, of well, who, what is doing all of this? And then, okay, well, it's a person, it's a ghost, uh, who who is the ghost what it, and and i gave away too much information in the very first scene that made some of the other actions that were taken in the book completely and utterly just it it was almost like they were dragging because they were dragging behind what i accidentally gave away right and that's telegraphing <laughs> yes that is that is so it can be a small thing it can be a large thing it can be you know just blatantly dropping the murder weapon on the first page um and and making too much of a fuss about it um yeah yeah that's another thing that a lot of people do is 
they and uh, movies are really bad at this especially nowadays where you know it's, it's that showing the gun on the wall um you know that the gun is going to have to be used especially if it goes into detail <laughs> or like with with movies they'll focus on a a thing in the in the room an object or mm -hmm. something and you and then it, it pans to something else or it, it's it's pulling the focus too strongly to an item where you just kind of want it to to be part of the background yeah assume your readers are smarter than you and treat them accordingly mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. Is there anything else on telegraphing before we move into the writer's group? That's thing? everything I've got on telegraphing. That was just a little quickie. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the question on the writer's group was um, sort of more specific, but we're going to go into the kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of writer's groups, the kind of the truth of writer's groups, and just kind of go over some, some, some basics. Yes. Yes. So go ahead. And I will say right off the bat, I am a huge proponent of of a good writer's group. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of my skills, uh, learned a lot of things not to do from being a regular faithful participant in a writer's group for a number of years. And just real quick to break in, we do have a writer's group. It's in the forums. The forums are a writer's group. This is not that. This is, Holly has a writing community at hollyswritingclasses.com. You can join for free. You can pop in. You, free forums, free access to a lot of the forums. And you can build a little group within that area or build a little niche or, right. or just be a part of that group. But this is specifically about in-person writer's groups. Right, right. Showing up for meetings taking your manuscript, sitting down, reading your work, listening to other people read their work, live, in-person writer's groups. And if you can do one, and if you can do it safely, uh, which is that you're meeting someplace, that everybody is safe, and everybody can get home safely, and uh, all yeah, of those so different things. Yeah, sort of things. a lot of people like coffee shops or libraries. Right, right. Or bookstores with coffee shops. I know that's a big one. Yep. Um, but it also, if you just if it's a bunch of friends you've known for a while, trade off houses. Yeah, every which we every did. other week or whatever. Yeah, I yeah. remember that that was Holly's thing was we were always at a different house. I actually remember going to quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took you guys, and and I think it, it influenced you a little bit. But um, in person has some real benefits to it if it's a good group. And mm -hmm. that's the big thing, is you have to know whether the group that you are in is a good group. And so this is going to be about what makes a group good and how to build one or how to identify one and how to stay away from the ones that are horrible. Yeah. Um, so let's, what, the first thing that you're going to look at is does this group have a goal and do they get that in front of you right away and if you're starting a group what's your goal and this is as simple as um are you looking for bug hunts are you looking for crits uh, are you looking for a way to inspire people to get their asses in the chair and bring new work every week let's define bug hunts and crits for folks oh okay yeah that was that was kind of okay once you have written something you want to know whether it's any good or not and uh, you want to know whether you have mistakes in it. So part of what a, a small writer's group can do is read your stuff. After you have the whole thing finished, after you have cleaned it up as best you can, and find the places where things went wrong. Or find the places where you missed on the story, where you have bad characterization, where you dropped the plot element, um, where you forgot something essential. So what's the difference between a critique, which is what you said a crit was? What's a critique versus a bug hunt? Okay. The critique is when you're reading it out loud and people are listening to what you are reading and they're writing down notes about what isn't working in the story right there. You can have something, you can get a crit on something at any time. You can get a crit in first draft. You can get a crit in final draft. And it's generally a good idea when you are getting started to 
to learn how to do this with people who are friendly, um, to understand what works and what doesn't work for somebody who's a reader. Really, if yeah, if you've if you've got a group of writers, they should all be a group of readers as well. Yes, yes, and so if you if you are a writer, you need to have written you need to have read as much as your eyes can hold for as long as you can have been doing it. Reading is the first skill of a good writer. And knowing what works for you and knowing what doesn't work for you is something that you grow over time uh, so that you can be terribly uncritical when you're young and get a lot pickier as you get older. Yeah. You know, and then you want to find the the, the writers who hold up for you. For me, Lawrence Block is like, you know, the, the, the sun at the top of the mountain. Um, but you just, you have to know what works for you and why. And that's a skill you build. So what's the bug hunt? The bug hunt is once you have done your first draft, once you have done your revision, and once you have it in what you think is ready to go. And, and you've had the critiques to help you right. with the revision. Right. You've had the critiques that have helped you write that final draft and then revise and then do get the whole thing ready. Then you put it in front of your guys and you say, okay, <laughs> what I screw up? And they go through and they find your typos and your spellos and your screwed up punctuation and places where you accidentally deleted a paragraph or a, a page or whatever and the book becomes unreadable because of it. Or where you use the same word for word description of what the character is writing uh, or wearing five times in the book. Uh, and or if, if, a, if a character was in one scene and then suddenly they're halfway across the world and then suddenly they're back to that other oh yeah other setting yeah right Just right magic magic <laughs> transportation or, or eyes that change color yeah yeah, yeah. The just the, there are so many things that you won't catch because you're too close to the work mm -hmm. and putting it in front of people who are on your side and who wants you to make it the best book that it can be because when you succeed, they share a part of your success because you're going to put them in your acknowledgments <laughs> and thank them personally for saving your ass and keeping you from looking like an idiot, um, then you, you have this thing where you're working together and you're all helping each other out and you are building towards something bigger than just you where, where the group of people is all getting something big out of this. So that's having a defined goal for the group is yeah. basically and, and the the bug hunting and the crits it can it can be that the group does all of that it can be that the group is also um, if if you're all new I think I, I don't know if you cover this but kind of having this being on the same level yeah everybody it's being on the same level yeah if if you've got one person in there you do cover that yeah that's I have it. I have an article on my site, and I cover that but there. but And we'll link to the article in case you want mm -hmm. it. But um, I didn't, didn't actually specifically have it here, so that's a big deal. Sorry if you guys were hearing that my cat was trying to open the door. Usually he doesn't have a problem, but apparently today he's being a spaz. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, being on the same level is important. You'll cut down on the likeliness of somebody who's condescending or comes across as too brash. Um because they are at a different level and they don't realize what they're saying is a little bit too harsh for, let's say, a beginner, something like that. There should never be any harsh, ever. Well, I, oh, well I think... Yeah, I mean, when you're new, you don't understand that you have made mistakes. Yeah. But... Yeah. So and everything's going else... seem harsh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But there is a difference between harsh um, because you just simply don't know that you made mistakes and harsh because somebody's an asshole. Yeah. And we are going to cover that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's next after having that, that defined goal for the writer's group? Okay. So you have sat down and you said, well, we're going to show up for um, meetings once a week and or once a month or twice a month or whatever. And uh, everybody's going to bring new work. So we're going to keep our group small so that we have time to get through everybody's work. And they're all going to bring a chapter or a story or whatever, and we're going to read it out loud, and everybody's going to listen. And that's that's the goal. Once you have that goal, then you say, okay, well, um, not every book is going to work for everybody, and not every genre is going to work for everybody. So what is our 
genre or our genre group. And my writer's group, Schrodinger's Pet Shop, was science fiction and fantasy. And uh, within that, we were we were pretty broad, you know, there was just pretty much any science fiction, any, any fantasy, but, uh, we were not a good fit for any literary writers. And, uh, we were not a good fit for historical novelists and we were not a good fit for anything else because basically what you write is what you read, Mm -hmm. um, in most cases and what you love most about what you read Yeah, for, for those of us who read everything. Um, and we were, we were a group of people who just freaking loved science fiction and fantasy and were broadly read in it, knew what was good in it, knew what sucked in it, and were at that level of just getting started where we were trying to write and we knew what was good because we'd read it and we knew we weren't good (laughs) because when we listened to each other, we were hearing all this stuff that we knew was wrong. And and I got I got to say here, um, you will learn more from from listening to other people's work than you will ever learn from your own because you are not critical of your own work. And you're not too close to someone else's work. Exactly. So you can hear mistakes or if you're if you're passing a manuscript around, um, and making copies for everybody if it's a small group and you can afford to do that, then you're reading mistakes and you're going, oh my God, I do that too. Because it's so much easier to see a mistake in somebody else's work than it is in your own because, again, you're too close to it. A lot of the time, too, it's not even an oh my God moment. It's just you, you're you reading something and you point it out that on somebody else's work and you just... Sometimes you naturally evolve and sometimes you'll catch yourself doing the same thing Mm -hmm. and stop and (laughs) fixing it and not even knowing, not even being able to link it to where you have learned or if you've done a crit on somebody's work or or you've done a um, like then then it comes to your work and you're reading it out loud and you might notice it or, or the other people will notice it and somebody will point it out and it's the exact same thing you caught on somebody else's work. Right. And you're like, you notice it kind of when you're reading through. There's just, it, it, it's so helpful to read other people's work. It's helpful for you and that person. Yeah, it is. It is the best training ground I ever had because seeing what other people did that I as a broad, deep reader recognized as a mistake then through what I had done that was the same mistake back in my face and also when I didn't do it it made sure I never did it anyway and when she says threw it back in her face it's, it's not a rude thing it's no. just oh I oops it, it feels like oh shit I just you know <laughs> knocked this other person's you know moment in that book I, I, I pointed that out and then I have it in mind too mm-hmm. and this is something where You really do kind of want to be more genre specific because there are certain tropes that are that are known in certain genres. Like if you're heavily into a romance genre, you're going to know all the tropes. You're going to know all of the 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 stuff you can get away with. No, I'm saying the stereotypical mistakes that people make, the, the stuff that don't really work or that you've read a million times in a million different romance novels so that's why being genre specific is so important if you have this huge group of people writing but you're all in different genres well somebody writes contemporary horror somebody writes uh basically like that torture horror somebody else likes gothic uh suspense paranormal somebody else writes sci-fi you're just going to be sitting around digging on each other's work not liking what you're hearing or not not really attaching to the story yeah there there's there's just if if you don't read broad okay so read reading broadly is one thing but but knowing the genre in which you want to write it's going to make it so much easier if everybody else is writing in that same genre to be able to point out the problems whereas 
if somebody is writing in in a the torture horror <laughs> torture stuff, porn, yes, <laughs> and you've never and you've never read torture horror, you're not you're not going to know what's good, what's been done a million times, mm -hmm. what's bad, but, what I mean. <laughs> but also, there's almost no chance that you're going to like it, and you need to have the potential to love everything the potential to love what the other people in your group are writing has to exist they have to have a chance to win you which yeah. means they have to you guys have to share this common ground of well this is what we love and if you if you can pick out a handful of writers that you really that you love and everybody else goes oh yeah i love them too you've got this common ground you know terry pratchett lawrence block um stephen king you you you've got if you share those loves and are trying to write in a genre that fits within what this shared love you have the potential of everybody getting something good out of the group yeah yeah and and more than just book recommendations for for your next read it's right. it's, it's people who are deeply invested in this love of this genre mm -hmm. that want to help each other and help themselves yeah so what else what's the next okay so bit? after you have kind of defined your group's genre or have had it defined to you if you're coming into an existing group then what constitutes work at a meeting and what percentage of the members work this gets tricky because when you walk in is everybody standing around talking about hmm. just writing, um, talking about um, books that they've read, talking about um, the, standing at the table, eating the munchies, because we always had munchies at our meetings. Um, but we had a specific time, and once, we, once that time hit, everybody sat their asses in chairs, brought out their manuscripts, and started reading them. You have to see that there's actual work being done, that this is not just a group of people who are getting read together to talk about writing, because that's yeah. not going to help anybody. And that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that if you want to sit in a you know, place and, and talk to your friends about writing, but that's not the writer's group. We had, um, like, there's different kinds of writer's group. I, I had a NaNoWriMo writer's group that I attended. I've done this a couple of times, and the goal is you... You have a specific amount of time where you're sitting and you're working distraction free with other writers. It's just kind of it's it's not very vocal, obviously, <laughs> but there it's just the idea of yes, we are. It, it, it's it's like setting work hours, and you have coworkers, and your all and your goal is to do the same thing. And one of them had like a timer that would go off, and then they would take a small break and then we'd come back and we'd sit back down and, and, and actually write. But if you have somebody who is constantly saying, Oh God, you got to listen to this great thing I just wrote or, um, constantly offering to help critique other people as, as they're working, that is not somebody who is sitting there with the same goal in mind. That is somebody who is going into this, uh, as an ego thing. And I know that we'll get into that one yeah. later, Yeah, but yeah, you you have to have what it is that you want to achieve defined. Right, and once you once you have defined what you want to achieve, when you show up, you have to see work being done. And for us, that was that was reading our manuscripts, showing up with stuff we had written away from the group, and then reading manuscripts and people taking notes, and then going around the group and saying what we found about the books and you get to define this yourself yeah you keep saying manuscripts but it's not like you're reading a whole book out loud it's it's no it was our pages like yeah it's maybe a, a chapter or maybe somebody else is coming in with a new short story every single time or something like mm -hmm. that right and then every person gets a certain allotted amount of of either i don't know like not time but work that they can read that way that not one person is hogging all of the help. Exactly. <laughs> Where you have each, you're doing this in little segments. Um, just as you write maybe a chapter for that two-week period or two chapters, you can bring a part of that. You bring a, read a part of that. You bring a part of it. You read a part the next time. Um, and other people do the same thing 
and you have to take turns. Yeah. And yeah, and one person and they're well, okay, but we're going to get into this other stuff later. <laughs> so, um, again, what constitutes work at a meeting and what percentage of the members work? Is there, so, is there only one person who's bringing stuff in or does everybody bring things all the time? And you you want the latter, not the former. You want everybody be to who participates to actually be be doing the work, be writing, be be presenting things to you because again, you learn more from from doing a critique of somebody else's work than you learn more from your own mistakes. And yeah. they learn more about their own work and what to fix from critiquing your work. Yeah. Okay. Um how many people show up? Now this is a big deal. Because we we got way popular at one point, um, where we had 20 people showing up for a meeting, and that was impossible, because you, there just there aren't enough hours. I mean, we were getting home at three o'clock in the morning, um, after getting there at seven o'clock the previous night, um, and even then we hadn't didn't have a chance to go through everybody's stuff. So you have to have a limit. You have to keep the group small. You and can break them up into different sections if, if you really wanted to keep all of those people and then maybe rotate writers per section. But that just seems like an awful lot of work. Right. Whereas if you just have, okay, well, Bob moved to Oregon and he's not going to be able to come anymore. So we have room for one person in our five-person group. Do you know anybody who we might bring in? But, but not just open doors and we had open doors for a long time and realized it and it became impossible so yeah. it's it's that's a mistake you don't want to make you want to, to realize well okay we're writing long chapters and we would like to critique each person's each chapter every time we get together uh, you know one chapter per person you can do maybe four or five people in a night and get home at a decent hour um, and not get yourself killed on the road driving home at 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. um, which is important. You know, you don't want to die at this. Okay, and then the next thing is what are the crit rules and what is the tone of the crits? <laughs> there are a couple of different kinds of crits. And you will, if you are new in a group and you are listening to one person read something, and everybody else is just gushing about how amazing it is. Mm. Um, the term for this is ass kissing, and it's not. It's not good. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. The it is not. We're not all getting in there to tell each other how wonderful we are, especially. And if you can listen to this thing, and you find you can hear places that are boring. You can hear places where there was way too much character description. You can pl hear places where the plot slowed down. You could hear some sort of an obvious mistake. The, and, and everybody else is going, oh, my God, that was wonderful. And then the next person reads, and again, it's not wonderful, but the response is, oh, my God, that was wonderful. You're not going to get anything out of this group. Yeah. It is not going to help you because they are not going to welcome your... Um, comments on plot and characterization and structure and world building and errors that you hear and places where they went wrong because they're just there to tell each other everything is wonderful okay ass kissing is not a good group um the the opposite of this is the shark tank yeah and this is where you come in and you read something and it is ripped to shreds and you are told that your your work is awful and you are not you and you are not given constructive criticism okay well you know you had a problem with slowdown in this scene where you go, you're doing an awful lot of step by step action but the the point of the scene was really good it's just oh my god this is terrible that's not helpful and and yeah yeah and there can it can get a lot nastier than oh my god this is terrible it can oh, be yeah. you know you you really shouldn't be a writer this is this is so bad that there is no hope for you and we had one woman who showed up at the writers group with her um bound manuscript she had the whole thing, it, which she brought to the, the two meetings that she attended, 
before we kicked her out of the group um, where she had the entire thing and every time she would critique she would use her manuscript as an example of doing it right and <laughs> and what they had done as an example of doing it wrong and we did not kill her but we did kick her out we had we had yeah. to she was the person for whom we developed the rule about okay if everybody votes on you can't stay then you can't stay and I sent her the letter saying you can't stay. <laughs> yeah, it's very important that you take care to watch how people critique other people. Oh, my God. There's a difference between being overly sensitive and precious about your work and un unable to receive criticism and the person who loves tearing into others things yeah. and loves pointing out okay well all of this is real shitty this is why it's really shitty this is who did it better this is you know mm -hmm. it, it's often presented as help oh, presented yeah. as constructive criticism but it's not it's destructive it is generally presented with the words no offense yeah and then they get very defensive about their critique of your work as well mm -hmm. uh we we did have an entire episode on constructive criticism versus destructive criticism i'll link that in the right. in the show notes so we don't have to go too deeply into that particular area but it is a very very important thing to look for right and and it is very important to have a way to remove a person from the group who has a an evil gleam in their eye every time they get ready to tell you what you did wrong and why you suck. Because yeah. the first thing you do with a critique is you bring out what's good. This is 100% of the time, what did the person do right? Because there is always going to be something right in every single manuscript you listen to. And if you have somebody who all they're seeing, all they're doing is ripping people, they're not they are there to boost their own egos often you'll run into they're the ones who started the group they're the ones whose this is their group mm -hmm. um so it would be if you found people that you like just get their emails while you're there and email them and you don't necessarily want to steal members <laughs> but you want to <laughs> say something along the lines of well this group isn't working for me but i really liked your feedback on this and this and and is there a time where we could just hang out and maybe help each other and maybe then in that very subtle way you can start saving people from this this piranha of a human being right right because there are people out there who um their joy is in crushing what they see as crushing the competition well some some people actually see it as helpful criticism and it's not some people actually think they're doing these these authors a favor by just destroying the work and they're not yeah well yeah i'm i'm at this point unwilling to to anybody who is that absolutely brutal and absolutely where where they're using their own work as the example for everything that's done right and everything that everybody else does is wrong um i i don't think they're do they think they're doing anything good i think they are just using the group to crush people and to crush the competition so what you are looking for is realistic good and bad both in what you get from other people and in what you give to them and you always 100% of the time start with what's good but then you go over what's bad and and you have to be you have to give specific tangible examples of what's bad where you are listing okay well in that scene in this one place you had this one character who did this one thing that was blatantly obvious it was it was telegraphing your your what the what's going to happen in the next scene it was giving something away it was it was out of character for the character if this if you're a couple of chapters into the book and you've heard previous stuff and you hear them do something wrong and and you are your objective in doing this is to learn from other people's work what not to do in your own but also to learn from other people's work what they do better than you and how could you learn to do something that good and there are always going to be 
there's always going to be something that somebody else is better at than you are. And it's important to recognize that and not attack them for being that good, but to say, wow, you know, that was, that was truly amazing. And I, I loved it. And if you, if you get people to laugh at the funny bit while you're reading, you win. And if you laugh at something that somebody else was, was writing that was funny, you win. If you, if you see them with tears in their eyes as you're reading the sad bit, or you get teary-eyed, you got to say that, man. When they're reading something and you get all choked up, you lead with that. You bring yeah. in, oh, my God, you evil bastard, you made me cry. It was amazing. Thank you. And not at the same time, you evil yeah. bastard. Yeah, let them know when they did something that that really moved you. Yeah. Even if it even if you didn't like obviously ball, you can take your notes and wrote, okay, well this this choked me up. And then like Holly's saying, lead with the good mm -hmm. because it it does soften the blow of when you bring in the critiques, but it also shows them that they're on the right path. Yeah. Yeah, and there will always be something that's good always. Okay. And then the next Thing that you are looking for is in the group that you're in and whether you're new or whether you're old how do people react to the crits you give them um, because this is a give and take this is you're there to learn in theory they're there to learn and if you have someone I'm going to use the member from hell again <laughs> as an example where she was reading her own work, which she had been bludgeoning us with, with every single thing where she said, well, in my book, I did this. And, and then she read her work, and it was mediocre and bland and massively overwritten. And there were some good things in it. And we followed our own rules, and we led with the good things. And then, oh my God, we dared to say, okay, but this was a slow scene where nothing important happened. And she went through the fucking roof. How dare we suggest that she, who had finished this book, I was at this point already selling novels, okay? She had finished this one. How dare we criticize her work because she had finished this book in first draft and it had the whole book right there to prove it um that's not the reaction you're looking for when you are trying to when you are working under with the understanding that people are there to learn and to get better yeah that they want to know what they did wrong so they can fix it yeah okay that's a big deal yeah somebody who's being far too precious about their own work or they, they came in and they're obviously just looking for people to tell them how amazing they are. That's not what you want in your group. But you also want to make sure you're not going in there with, you know, oh, my God, you know, the idea that I, I wrote the perfect scene. I'm going to blow them away. Mm -hmm. And then when you read it and they actually have critiques for you that you don't allow yourself to get what they call nowadays butt hurt. That, that you don't allow yourself <laughs> to have your feelings hurt. That you don't get defensive about your writing. That you don't make excuses. Because everybody is there to learn. And yeah, taking crits is hard, especially in the beginning. Oh my God, yes. It yes. can be brutal. It, it, honestly, it's not that easy after you've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, because Matt will go through my stuff, and Matt is the kindest human being on the planet when doing a crit. I was going to say, when when it comes to the creative work. Yeah, when, when it, it comes, comes to, to the, the creative work. Stuff. Yes, he is, he is just, just so gentle. Yeah. But he will find the mistakes, and he finds the mistakes I make, and my First reaction is to argue, and my mm -hmm. second reaction to to shut my mouth and not argue, and I stop myself one hundred percent of the time mm -hmm. because he's right, and that pain will go away. It that, does. That, it gets easier. It, well, no, I'm saying the pain of the crit. It's your, you know, your initial reaction 
is you know the heated fla- face, the flushed body, the the <laughs> anger, the the embarrassment, <laughs> yeah. the humiliation, the 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 tears, the disappointment, tears. That all of that is there, but that's temporary. True. That is absolutely one hundred percent temporary. It doesn't ever really necessarily go away entirely. So like every time you get another critique, you're, you, you that reaction is still a possibility. Yeah, but that particular crit the pain of that will go away especially when you realize it's something you can fix Mm -hmm. especially when you realize that that person was right and that you can make this better and that that this thing that was broken you can fix it and it it, it's kind of to the point of where you're saying thank you thank you for catching this god-awful description that i wrote or this this info dump that i had in there that i that i was you know two pages long and I was so proud of and and you're right you're right it doesn't belong in here right. and I've made the book better for it right because it slowed down the pace or it it, it just made a scene drag that was or, could you be know a it solid scene was lulling people into a coma <laughs> so you really don't want to do that no because if they put the da- book down the chances are good that they won't pick it back up mm-hmm. and you your objective is to keep them so engrossed in the final product that you create that they take the book to the toilet with them and don't go to sleep that night. Yeah, or like if if you have to work, you take the book with you and you try to read it on your lunch break or if it's still at home, you can't fucking wait to get home just to get that fucking book open again. Yes, you know. yes. You know, (sighs) that's, and and that that is my objective with every book I write. And in the places where I miss it, I have learned to be very grateful when Matt finds the places where I screwed up and then to just not say anything yeah. because I, I still get defensive. I don't get teary eyed anymore. I don't. But there is still this moment of, no, I'm right. You're, no, I'll just shut up and look at it. And sure as shit, I was wrong. <laughs> yeah it's a growing process and it isn't fun but it is essential because you are never going to be perfect with a manuscript yeah there's always going to be something so what's the next point the next point here is okay after you have looked at how people take crits in the group now can you remove problem people using an established rule in the group and this is something that you, you're going to come in on the ground floor uh, and build your own group or you're going to move into somebody else's group. And if you're moving into somebody else's group, you have to ask, is there anything that could get me kicked out of the group? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what do you consider unacceptable behavior for a member? And if they, they don't have something and you notice that the meetings are badly run and there's a lot of ass kissing and there's a lot or a lot of shark tanking um, or even a lot of dawdling around oh and just God, or fucking even just talking yeah, just talking yeah. and not getting any work done the, all of those three are signs of, of of run the fuck away from this group it is not going to get you where you want to go and where you want to go is to turn your work into publishable work mm-hmm. and the objective of the group should be some variant of help all of our members become publishable writers. Yeah, that's one of the things I liked about NaNoWriMo was um, they had sort of like district leaders and it, you would sign up to become a district leader and and you would manage basically groups for that area. And some of them were really shitty, <laughs> but... <laughs> The ones that I showed up to that I really liked, um, there were two. One of them, actually, she had little gift bags. Little, just, just, they were just tiny, small little paper bags that had a NaNoWriMo sticker on it and a little pen and a little pad inside and a piece of candy. It was just her way of of creating a community. And I just really, uh, I, I... I remember thanking her and saying, you know, you're, you're doing it right. But the two that I liked had... A paper that they passed out and it was kind of one of them had a schedule for the day 
um, because we were only going to be there for like, I think it was like three or four hours. One of them had a schedule and it told you when you could ask questions. It told you when, if you, if you needed to take a break and ask a question during the writing time, it gave you the opportunity of their 10 minute break where they were coming in. The other one had, um, just the rules of the group and a time schedule at the bottom saying, okay, after this, and then it had the place where every writer could write an email address or a phone number, whatever, so that you could get in contact with each other. Nice. And yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing, if you're walking into something and there is some form of organization, there is some form of structure and maybe a couple of rules, that's a good sign. It's it's not always perfect. It's not always going to be the right group for you, but it's a good start. Yeah. I had gotten to the point where I was printing off a Schrodinger's Pet Shop handbook that anytime we had a new member come in, I would hand them the handbook. And it had the rules in there for, you know, what what we do, how the re- meetings run, what will get you kicked out. And how to do a crit. Yeah. How, how to your do particular a... group did the crits. Yeah. Yeah, this is what we do. This is how we do it. Um, we, we One person reads. The other people listen and take notes. We go around the room. And uh, the person who who is critting, you, the, the person who is being critted does not get to rebut. Yeah. Um, you just sit and you listen. And then you get the notes get handed to you. And, and you if take, you have any questions yeah, you to can clarify questions. things. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't get to rebut. Because yeah. rebutting is, no, I'm right and you're wrong. And once you get home and you look at your manuscript and you look at the notes that you've been given, you almost always find out, no, they were right, I was wrong, but yeah. you're wasting somebody's time if you rebut. The, so then, again, I'm going to just recap that. Uh, can you remove problem people uh, using established rule? And the only survivable group answer to this question is yes. If there is not a way to remove problem people, you don't want to be there. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is, the next one is really easy. Do you like the other writers? Yeah. You know, so we're already assuming that you are all fans of the same genre, that, that you guys have a lot in common, but do you like them? You know, you're, that, that should be a small group of people. It's going to be people you're going to be hanging out with a lot. Yeah. Um, so is, <laughs> liking them is important. And... And having them like you is important. Um, And having none of them being married to another member who hits on you is important, I say, as the person who left the group I founded because of that problem. Um, Yeah, you you don't, you want to have a good chemistry to where you feel comfortable giving honest critiques yeah. to where you're looking at everything as you want to genuinely see these people succeed. You want to have each other's best interests at heart and also your own best interests at heart and know that they want the same for you. Um, but you, you don't, you don't want there to be drama. You, you, oh God, you don't no. want there to be talk of politics. That's a good rule to throw in. No talk of politics, no talk of religion. Yeah. Um, you don't want things to get too personal within the time of the meeting. You know, that that when you get together, the meeting is for the writing. And right. you want to be able to have a decent relationship with all of these people mm-hmm. so that you all genuinely want to help each other and see each other succeed. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you can find, you can find the person of your life at a writer's meeting. Um, and you can also find... Um, other things, but all of that stuff has to be outside of the meeting. Mm-hmm. It has to be on your own time because the meeting is just for the writing. And that, yes. that has to be for everybody who's there. Um, okay, and then what kind of a group, what size of a group? Um, those, we've kind of covered those elsewhere. Yeah. It needs to be small. It needs to be um, pretty tight-knit. It needs to be manageable in common. Yeah. 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 And it, yeah. And it helps um, if everybody's writing at about the same level. Although if you have somebody who um, I, I was already published at the point where our writers group really started getting big. Uh, I, and I was the only one who was at the time. But but that was only like kind of a step above. So it, it, it's yeah. for, for some of the authors you were 
two or three steps above, but but as a majority, you kind of meshed with the whole. Right. So that's the idea is that you kind of want everybody to be around the same playing field. If, if somebody yes. has published a couple of novels um, and they're making a life or an income off of this and they're, you know, making it their whole world. And then you've got the person who's coming in and doing 10 minutes a week because that's all they, or 10 minutes a day, every day, because that's all they have. There might be too much of a disparity between that level. But for, try it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. try it. Give, give whoever it is, whether you have somebody who's coming in who is already published and they're new to the group, or whether you have somebody who is just a beginner who's new to the group. Um, yeah, give because them a you can always learn. Yeah. No matter what end of the spectrum you're on, whether you're the beginner or the, the person who's published a few times, you can always learn. It's just you don't want to master literature and <laughs> someone who's brand new and very green yeah. in the exact same group. It's not going to be very helpful i right. think right yeah well at the point exactly at the point where we very first got started and got our first members none of us had been published i was the only one who at, at that point had written a novel it was the god-awful novel but i had written the damn thing but yeah so you want a common ground and, and you mm. want to be able to move back and forth without the person who is publishing 10 books a year being bored off his ass and getting a little snide because everybody yeah. else is a, a rank beginner. Okay, so then the last thing, and this is, believe it or not, the biggest thing of all. Is it fun? Do you look forward to going? Do you look forward to showing up? Does going to the meeting give you an incentive to do the work so that you have something to read at the meeting? Does it make it easier for you to accomplish your writing goals? Do you love it? Because if you don't, you're going to be wasting your time and you're going to be wasting the time of the people who do. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I mean, yeah. So I, I hope that these two questions have been pretty solidly answered. If you have any questions about this episode, or if you have any questions at all, you can go to um, hollyswritingclasses.com. Find our forum. It is called Our Podcast Alone with Invisible People. It's probably the longest title, or Alone <laughs> in a Room with Invisible People. Yes. It's probably the longest title in the forums. You can also email us at show at alone with invisible people .com. Um, if you're signed up to the mailing list and you're getting the emails, you can just respond to one of those, hit reply and ask us the question if it needs to be anonymous. If you want, if you have any tips, you know, that you have found helpful, share that in the podcast. Look for this episode title and go in and, and share your own tips or ask questions about what other people have experienced or share your hell person experience or your hell group experience or share your good group experience, you know, or if you're looking for a group online and you want to get a, a you know, another person or two or three to get together on a regular basis on Zoom or Skype or something like that, reach out in the forums and see if there's somebody else that wants to help. You know, somebody else on your same level that want to get together and you want to read each other's work and, and just kind of help each other out because that's what the forums are there for. Um, you can follow us on Facebook at Alone in a Room with Invisible People, on Twitter at AIARWIP, on Instagram at Alone with Invisible People. We're also on Pinterest. Just look up Airwhip or Alone with Invisible People. And uh, we do have a red bubble shop. It has a, a couple of different merch items in there. It's re some really cool stuff. I, I like it. We've got coffee cups. We've got notebooks. We've got tote bags and stretchy uh, pants. Yeah, stretchy pants. Yeah, <laughs> we've got leggings that I need to inverse because they are very see-through. So I would not suggest <laughs> buying the leggings unless you like see-through butts. Um <laughs> Yeah, so just different stuff. We only earn a couple of cents to a couple of dollars depending on what you buy. But we want to see people with a coffee cup or merchandise with, with our logo on it. And you guys have asked us for it. So it's up there. And uh, if you do 
actually buy something, if you buy a merch, if you buy a notebook or a coffee mug, tag us in it, you know, t- or, or use the hashtag air whip and we'll find it. And really with anything, um, share the podcast with your writer friends, share it with Facebook friends, you know, ask people like, Hey, have you ever wanted to write? Um, here's, you know, a cool podcast that's helping me out. If, if it is, you know, we, we, that's, that's the best way to, to help us get our words out there to help us get our help out there because yeah. <laughs> we are trying to help as many people as possible. Um, and then there, if you want to find out other ways to support the podcast, just go to, uh, alone with invisible people.com forward slash support us. And it'll show you all the different ways. So I am just going to say thank you guys so much for listening. That has been our episode for this week, and we hope that it's been helpful. And uh, we love you guys. We'll see you next week, Holly. Absolutely. It is it is a joy to do this podcast because we get to hear back from you guys. We get to hear on the forums. We get the emails. We get to see how you're doing. And we get to help you not just do it, but uh, eventually help you promote your work. Um, you know, if you do the year of winning at writing and you have a white, you have your writing is winning pip and you have your, um, you, you get to the end of the year and you have something that you get to sell, then we, we will link to that, man. We will put it up there and we will help you because this is a big deal for us that, that you get to live your dream too, because we're living ours.